Turn with me in your Bibles to Haggai chapter 2. We will be finishing our series in the book of Haggai. We'll look at the last four verses. Turn with me to Haggai chapter 2, and we'll be looking at verses 20 through 23. Let us read together from God's Word. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you a, like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. So far, the reading from God's word. May he bless it to our hearts this morning. Well, there's uh, something of a ritual that belongs to buying anything electronic. You go walk into Best Buy or into the AT&T store and you, you pick up your little electronic device, your phone maybe, or your television screen, and you get to the checkout, and what are they going to try to sell you next? They're going to try to sell you the extended warranty, hopefully three years. That would be good for them. Now, why are they selling you this warranty? They're trying to make you feel assured that the thing you have purchased will not break, that if your television screen would implode on itself, that you simply take it back to the store and, and they will supply you with a new one. If you uh, break your phone, the same thing. You will have a replacement at no charge. It is a guarantee. It is the warranty. And this prophecy is dealing with that same kind of issue, except in life not in electronics. This prophecy is the warranty for the people of Israel. It is the guarantee of their safety in the middle of circumstances that may seem less than certain for them. So we're going to look at this last prophecy, and I have not broken it down into any points because I think the point of the prophecy is simply singular. Uh, we're going to look at this prophecy in these four verses and then draw some conclusions about the book, uh, the prophecy of Haggai. So let's look together uh, at verses 20 through 23. Now, uh, we find ourselves still on December the 18th, 520 B.C. This is the last day of Haggai's ministry. You remember the ministry of Haggai is very short-lived. He's only recorded to be a prophet for 111 days. He begins in August, August 29th, and here we are in December and he's finishing off his prophetic, his recorded prophetic ministry. Last time we looked at the book of Haggai, we saw the first prophecy of that day. Uh, we were reminded how uh, Israel was not cleansed by what they touched. We weren't cleansed by the work of their hands, the rebuilding of the, the temple that they were engaged in. Uh, but they were pointed to the, the blessing of God. Uh, the blessing of God on his people as a certainty of their standing. And so this prophecy is going to expand that and explain it for us a little bit more clearly. How does God's blessing come to rest on the people of God? How can they be sure that it actually is going to remain there? And so here you have in verses 20 and uh, 21 and 22, uh, Haggai coming to speak to Zerubbabel. You remember, typically, uh, when Haggai was prophesying, he would speak to Zerubbabel and the governor, Joshua the priest, and then all the exiles. But here he only speaks to Zerubbabel, the governor. He is a descendant of Judah. We saw that this morning in our genealogy. And he addresses him because he specifically is over the civil realm. He is uh, the government, so to speak, of the colony uh, or the province of Judea. And so here Haggai comes and, and addresses this ruler of the, the civil realm. And really what happens here in this prophecy is that Haggai restates 
a prophecy that he has previously made already in verses 6 and 7 of the second chapter also. He speaks of how he will shake the nations, how he will destroy their strength. And so Haggai two months ago made that prediction, and now he is reassuring them again. In, in October, when he made this prediction, he said, Be strong, O exiles, because God will shake the nations. And now here he reminds them again, Be strong, because the Lord will shake the nations. Cultural centers are, are going to shift. Uh, powers that seemed indestructible are, are going to vanish. But you, O people of God, you will stand safely. It's going to happen at the Lord's hand, which is part of the reason for their comfort. You see it in verses 21 and 22. He repeats it. Uh, I am about to shake. I am about to destroy. The Lord speaking through his prophets, telling the governor that this upheaval is coming to them from the Lord's hand. The one who is over all things, he is the one who is going to bring it about. God is going to shake the heavens. God is going to overthrow the centers of power. He will destroy their strength. He will crush their military power. It's worthy of reminding of God's people because we're forgetful by nature. But it's the way that God has been dealing with nations all throughout history. You think about it even in the, in the history as recorded in the scriptures. Remember what happened to Israel when they, when they went into Egypt. How did they come out of that land? This mighty force of, of slaves. No weapons. Only oppression at the hand of, of mighty Pharaoh. The greatest nation of earth, on earth had Israel under its thumb. But God brought ten plagues. God brought Pharaoh to his knees so that the whole nation was destroyed. Or think in the book of Judges. Gideon, uh, the judge, he, he leads Israel in uh, shaking off the oppression of the Midianites. The Midianites came and they're described in, in, uh, uh, in Judges chapter 7 and verse 12 uh, as uh, locusts. That's what they looked like in the valley. They covered all the ground of the valley. That's how many there were. They were a mighty force. Uh, so mighty was their force that when the 32,000 Israelites gathered to make war on the people of Midian, and Gideon said, if any of you are afraid, you may go home. Of the 32,000, 22,000 left. It left Israel with an army of, of 10,000 people. And what did God say? Well, now with this mighty force, you're going to go wipe out the Midianites. Well, he says, it's too many. It's too many. Let me sort out who is going to be your army. And he ended up with how many kids? Do you remember? Do you remember the story? 300 soldiers defeated the hosts of Midian. Why 300? So that the people of Israel would know that this came from the Lord's hand. The Lord overthrew Midian's army. He shook that nation. And in one day, he wiped out 120,000 Midianites. This is the same God. This is the same God that's being described in the book of Haggai. Israel here in the returned exiles, less than 50,000 of them. We know from the book of Ezra that they are hated by those Around them, they are being ruled by mighty Persia, the new superpower of the Mediterranean. And then in verse 6 of chapter 2, Haggai tells them, Yet once more, as God has done in the past, so he will do again. Egypt, Midian, Philistia, Babylon, Persia, they're all the same. They're nations of men. They're under God's control. These kingdoms do not trouble the Lord of hosts because He made them. He made earth. He made heaven. 
He made the people that dwell under the sky. It is the Lord's work to bring them to their places of power. You see that in the book of Acts, uh, in Paul's sermon to the Athenians. And he speaks to them of God's power over uh, mankind. And he says there, And he, meaning God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Listen. Having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. This is the God of Israel. This is the God who is over this sad band of returned exiles who can't even get the temple put back together again without God's word reproving them. This is the God, the mighty God, who stands over all the nations. And so Haggai comes right at the end of his prophetic ministry, and he reminds Israel, God is going to shake the nations. Persia will be shaken. And he's saying to Israel, do not fear. Do not fear these kingdoms. Do not despair because of your weakness. Why? Because the Lord will bless you. He is the one who is overthrowing the nations. It is as if the prophet is saying, Israel, do not fear, do not place your confidence in princes, but trust in the Lord, be strong and believe. This is the message of Haggai. But when God removes the nations and even powerful nations like Persia, it is not replaced with a vacuum. Once Persia is defeated, and from history we know that the, the Greco-Macedonian Empire came along, and they were the superpower for a while. They defeated the Persians. And then when Greece faded into the background, who came along? The Romans came along, and they were a superpower, and, and they dominated the world for centuries. But they have faded into the background. We don't speak of the Roman Empire anymore unless we're reading from a history book. And so uh, God comes and, and He replaces powers with other powers. So is there anything for these returned exiles to rely on? Who is going to be their safe keeper? Is it going to be the earthly kingdom of David? Is it going to be the next empire? Who is it going to be that will make sure they continue as promised in the Word of God? And then we turn our attention to verse 23. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. The signet ring, it's, it's not really something we use a lot anymore unless we're uh, romantic in our disposition. But the signet ring was a, a ring that was carried around by a man of significance. It was like his signature. Well, we didn't have uh, 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 Xerox paper that we could just pull out a sheet and write on it and sign our names. It was a different time. And so the rulers would uh, take their ring and they would melt wax and they would place their ring in the wax to leave the imprint of that ring in the wax. Why? So that the people would know this carries the authority of such and such man. We see the signet ring being used in the book of Esther. You remember uh, Haman's plot to wipe out the Jews. Haman came and he offered to pay the king so he could wipe out the Jews. And the king says, you go ahead and, and do whatever you think is necessary. And here I give you my signet ring. Why did Ahasuerus, the king, give Haman, that vile Haman, why did he give him the signet ring? Because that ring carried the authority of the king. The king's orders were assigned to whatever paper, whatever parchment, whatever instruction Haman sent out in that kingdom. The implication is, whatever carries this mark is guaranteed by the king. It carries his authority. And so Haggai is saying that Zerubbabel is like that promised ring. Zerubbabel is like God's promise, his authority 
on the people of Israel. There is a, a guarantee that is established for Israel through this man. It is established through uh, this man, through the son of Shealtiel. God has chosen him and made him a representation of the guarantee for his people. Why Zerubbabel? What does he function as? Well, we have to remember where we are on the timeline for the history of redemption. Uh, we, if you're tracking with the history of redemption, we know we're post-fall. Adam's come and gone. We know we're post-Abraham. The time of the, the patriarchs has come and gone. We're post-David because Israel has been dragged off into exile, so the Davidic rule has, has come and gone. So what connects Israel to Christ? What connects Israel to Christ? It is found in Matthew chapter 1, of course, the significance of Zerubbabel. It walks through the genealogy of Christ from Abraham all the way to the present day, deals with the patriarchs, deals with the Davidic kingdom, and then it speaks of those who come after the, the deportation to Babylon. Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel. He is the link between the time of exile and Christ's coming. He is the promise of the continued line of Abraham. He is the seal connecting to the only permanent kingdom that will ever be. You remember in Daniel chapter 2, there's that, that vision that Daniel has of the, the great statue, the head of gold and the, and the chest of silver and the, uh, the, the waist of bronze and then the legs of, of, of iron and then the feet of clay and iron mixed together. And we remember that, that statue very clearly. But perhaps we have forgotten that something else comes at the end of that vision. At the end of that vision comes a stone. The stone comes out of the mountain and it, it comes down the mountain and it knocks down the statue and it covers the whole world. Something that will never be moved. A permanent kingdom, a kingdom that will have no end. It is the kingdom of Christ. It is the kingdom of our Savior. And so Zerubbabel uh, really acts to redirect the eyes of God's people from the politics of their day. And fixes their gaze specifically on the Heavenly Father, the promiser of their salvation. So, people of Haggai's day, Christian, do not let this world trouble you. Your king is sovereign. Your savior has come. Christ, he is your guarantee. Zerubbabel is the signet ring that, that speaks of him. And he has come so we can rest easy in the storms of life i want us to see several things about that first of all we can learn that the weak can glory in their weakness how much the the church in syria and in iraq need to be reminded of this promise i'm sure in this particular time the devastation and the bloodshed that is all around them yet the kingdom of god Announced at the cross and consummated at the second coming. Is it 95% sure? Is it 50% sure? It's guaranteed. It is certain. It will be here without doubt. It has already been ushered in as Christ has come. And so if we are tempted to despair when we look around us in our world, that we must remember the promise. We must read the promise. We must pray the promise. We must thank God for His promise. Meditate on it so that we would be able to stand like other people who have known that promise. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Paul and, and Silas. Peter, after he denied Christ. These men stood certain, firm and sure, certain that even in their weakness, something was true. The God of heaven and earth has promised me redemption. The heavenly kingdom will come and is unshakable. This is the faith of the people of God. We rest easy 
in our weakness because the one who promised us is great. Do not fear the one who can kill only the body. It also teaches those who feel themselves strong and to glory in their weakness. In our circumstances, I think that's relevant for us. We as a church live in a time of, of great prosperity and great peace. There's very little that, that troubles us. Perhaps more should trouble us. But we live in a, in a powerful nation. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, where do we turn for our safety? Do we look at our military? Do we look at the great power that we have in this world? Or do we look at the one who has promised us the only sure kingdom in heaven, the kingdom of Christ? Where does our help come from? What does Psalm 121 tell us? When we lift our eyes to the hills, where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So when we are strong, let us glory in our weakness. We are weak. Think of yourself in, among billions of people in 80 years of the 6,000 years that this world has been. That's who we are. One person, one man, one woman. We're insignificant. But we can, even in our perceived strength, glory in our weakness because Christ's church is sure. His kingdom has come and it will never be shaken. Then, whether you are weak or whether you think yourself strong, uh, we can learn contentment from these verses. We can learn that no matter what our circumstances may be, that there is a guarantee. There is a warranty that we have. It's not a three-year warranty. It's not a warranty on our phone. It's an eternal warranty. An eternal warranty for your soul. Did you buy it? Did you buy it because you did a bunch of good things? It was purchased for you. Somebody else bought it. And they hold it. They guarantee it. So that when you fall short of God's glory, you can be assured. And when we come to our circumstances, we can be tempted to desperation as Christians. We look around us. We look at the moral decay in the Western world, and we look at, uh, at different things around us, and we think, what's happening to our world? God's not asking that question. He's not saying what's happening to this world. He knows it, and He is our guarantor. Despair in our hearts actually comes from averted eyes, doesn't it? When we take our eyes off the promise of God, when we start looking to self, when we start looking at our own abilities, our own works, our own efforts. So instead, we ought to take the Bible's promise. We ought to look at the seal and see who signed it. The Lord signed it with the blood of Christ. So it is fully certain. It doesn't matter if you're weak or if you're strong. Your help comes from the Lord who made all. So if we think about Haggai's prophecy, we can trace all these different elements in it, coming to the final verses, the need for that final assurance for the people of Israel returned from exile. You see them starting out in that first prophecy. They're building paneled houses for themselves. All they're thinking about is their own luxuries, their own comforts. And Haggai calls them to repent of it. He says, leave your paneled houses and, and build the house of the Lord. Why is the worship of God neglected among you? And then they start building this temple. And then there's the temptation to discouragement. The temple that we're building seems so insignificant. Where are they looking? They're looking at their own hands, of course, and what they've done. And Haggai comes and says, this is going to be far more glorious than Solomon's temple. This is going to be far greater because the presence of the Lord will be there. Then you see the people of Israel moving on, this temptation of being self-satisfied. They're walking around saying, yeah, we're doing a good work here. We're rebuilding the temple of God. How many people get to say that they've done that? Look at us. What a special generation we are. And then comes Haggai's word. 
You're not made holy because of what you do. What you touch actually becomes unclean. But the Lord will bless you. The Lord is the one who blesses you. So then here in the final words of his prophecy, because holiness is a, is a blessing from God, because our being set apart as his people is guaranteed by him, we can be assured. We cannot worry about the works of our hands as a contributing factor to our salvation and to our failing. We turn and look to God alone for our salvation. That's how Haggai ends his ministry. There is a signet ring. You are assured, O people of God. And so Haggai's ministry ends. 111 days after he starts, he, he finishes. And if we were to summarize it with only a, a few words, we would summarize it the way Christ summarizes the life of the Christian in Matthew chapter 6. And he says, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and everything else will be added to you as well. What does Haggai say in his short ministry? He turns to the people of Israel. And he says, Don't look to yourself. Don't look to your own abilities, but serve the Lord, and then I'll go home. Let's pray together.